Hi, I'm Adam Porter and this is my board gaming vlog and today I wanted to talk about the market, the board game market um, and specifically you know what sort of games are publishers looking for right now and I suppose as a continuation of that which sort of publishers should you approach if you've designed a specific type of game. This was inspired by a question from one of my viewers, Remy, who on my uh, YouTube video, uh, which was called I've Designed a Board Game, How Do I Make Money From It? Um, Remy had asked, um, in, today's, uh, in today's market, are children still the main sort of demographic that publishers are focusing on, or have adult games become the main focus? Um, and uh, I think it's an interesting question and I think often uh, in sort of game design circles when I mix with other game designers very few of them are thinking about children's games. They're heavily focused on games intended for adults um, and yet these children's games they have designers uh, so they're just not mixing in the same circles as me necessarily. Um, I think the answer to the question is that there's not really one marketplace. There's lots of different disparate marketplaces and there's not all that much overlap between them. One way to think about it is uh, who is buying the game? Who's exchanging money to take that game home? Not who's playing it, who's buying it? Is that a child? Unlikely, really. Children don't tend to go out and spend their own money on board games. It's more likely to be a parent buying it on behalf of that child. Now, maybe that's an impulse purchase because the child is tugging on their coat saying, I want that, I want that. They've spotted a license they recognise, a TV programme they recognise, or they've seen some humour in the game, or maybe they've seen an advertisement for that game or they've heard their friends talking about it. If it's not that sort of impulse-led decision, then it may be the parents sat at home uh, thinking about what sort of game they want to buy their child for a gift. Maybe it's Christmas, maybe it's a birthday. Um, in that case, the parent is likely to go for something nostalgic, something familiar to them. Maybe as a child they used to play Monopoly with their parents. Maybe their parents used to play Monopoly with their grandparents. Uh, perhaps it's the, 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 the family game is Cluedo or Stratego or Scrabble, you know. But these are the sort of purchasing decisions that go on. This is why Monopoly sells over and over again. It's because of familiarity and that's what non-gamers, uh, by I, I mean Everybody's a gamer, right? Okay, but, but people who aren't immersed in our sort of hobby, they're looking for something simple, simple rules. They already know the rules to Monopoly. They know what sort of experience they're going to have. They've enjoyed it in the past, believe it or not. And so they're going to buy Monopoly for their kids, uh, even if it's Monopoly with a whole new rule set sort of mixed in there or Risk with a whole new set of rules. Well, that is still going to be an easier sale uh, than trying to sell them on a game that's totally new to them. Um, then the other thing that we have in the in the sort of the, these are mass market sort of approaches. The other the other group that we have are the casual gamers, the people who are they are adults, uh, but they're not going to be going into hobby shops. Uh, they're not going to tread into those more sort of geeky waters. No, no, they'll go to. WH Smith, maybe a toy shop, maybe Waterstone, I don't know, in the UK, they're going to, to high street sort of stores. They're going to be happy to play something that's a little bit naughty, a little bit risque. So Cards Against Humanity, Exploding Kittens are your real poster children for, for these sort of games. Um, simple rules, sit around with your mates, have a laugh, don't think about it too much. Then we've got the sort of hobby market. Now this is where we do have adults buying games for themselves, okay, to play. This was sort of made um, uh, acceptable in the 80s and 90s when, when Trivial Pursuit and Pictionary and Balderdash, these party games that came out around that time, focused on adults playing with other adults. And now we've got this whole world of strategic style games that are designed for adults to play. Um, of course, this may be uh, teenagers, it may be, it may be very young adults, but nonetheless, it's people who, have um, the sort of intellectual capacity and concentration span to sit down, read a rule book, work out how to play something relatively complex, teach it to other people and invest some serious time into it. It's a swamped market, this marketplace. Thousands of games coming out every year um, designed by adults for adults. Um, one of the main drivers of this is crowdfunding, so Kickstarter uh, and similar websites where people can publish games 
very very easily um, now uh, you know and raise the money and, and produce it themselves so new publishers emerging all the time through those sort of avenues which means that with so many games out there it's very hard to get your one noticed okay so when we ask the question what are publishers looking for right now we've got to determine what type of game we have are we going for a mass market approach because the stuff that those publishers are looking for is very different to if we're going for something very strategic it's been a long time since hasbro for example the the probably the biggest um, you know uh, board game company uh, in the world the mass market sort of approach it's been a long time since they've made any sort of seriously strategic games um, Risk Legacy a few years ago came out and of course Hasbro owns the rights to I uh, think Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons um, so they do have scope to tread in these sort of waters. Magic the Gathering a few years ago they came out with a sort of miniatures game version of that. I have no doubt that in the future we'll come back round to strategic games coming out from companies like Hasbro and they'll start to pull on that Magic the Gathering brand and Dungeons and Dragons brand and we'll start to see more games using those sort of licenses um, coming out from the mass market. But right now that's not where the mass market is. Mass market is all about impulse purchases, social media, shareable games, games where people will film themselves playing it, children will film themselves playing it, sharing it with their mates, with the advent of things like TikTok and, you know, really quick, snappy sort of things, then the games need to be quick and snappy and funny. And often the naughty games do well, again, with the children. So it's not just Cards Against Humanity with the adults, with the children, it's don't step in it where you're blindfolded and you've got to try and manoeuvre your way without treading in this sort of fake dog poo. Uh, games based around vomit and bogeys and farts. You'll see the supermarkets are absolutely full of these types of games, certainly in the UK. Um, and it is different in different countries. In Germany, in France, um, you know, you, you may see slightly more sophisticated type of games in the mass market. So in Germany, you've got the company Harbour, who make beautiful children's games. In France and America, we've got Blue Orange, um, who again make fantastic children's games. And Ravensburger in Germany, um, for a long time, have been wonderful at making um, really good children's games that really sort of um, last through the years. The gameplay experience, that is. Um, a lot of this stuff is driven by licenses from TV and you see Ravensburger starting to get into that now with games like Jaws and Jurassic Park. But these, uh, with Ravensburger, these games tend to be good games, first and foremost, with, with a license um, attached to it, as opposed to what used to be the case, where if you saw a license on a board game, you could automatically assume that it was going to be rubbish, which is not necessarily the case anymore. In the hobby market, um, well, now we're into this style of game where we've got all manner of different um, genres of games and, and what any one publisher is interested in right now is going to be different to what another publisher is interested in right now. So if you've designed a war game, uh, you know, a strategic war game, moving your military units around a map, then there's no point showing that to the vast majority of these companies. They would not be interested. But a war game publisher might jump on your game and that might be exactly the thing that they're looking for. Um, I don't know a great many war game publishers because uh, I don't really play that style of game, so I'm not going to give you any advice on who to approach from war game perspective. Um, if you move on to the more sort of uh, sci-fi, fantasy, th what we call thematic games, games with lots of conflict, uh, you're going through a dungeon or a spaceship, you're rolling lots of dice, having lots of combat, um, these games tend to appeal to American publishers, uh, some Eastern European publishers, maybe UK publishers. Um, but often these games are quite epic, they've got a lot of components, they're quite expensive, they take quite a long time to play. And so um, publishers might not take a chance on producing something like that because the market is relatively niche. Uh, expensive products, right? So, so these games tend to do quite well on crowdfunding platforms where somebody will self-publish a game like that. Uh, and, and, and so as a result, it might be quite hard if you've designed the game and you're not willing to publish it yourself to find a publisher that will take your game on and run, take your game and run with it. That said, again, it's not the style of game that I designed, so I have no experience of trying to pitch that style of game to a publisher. 
Euro games, on the other hand, and I know Euro game is a very loose definition these days, um, but I'm talking about games that play in maybe under an hour, not that much direct interaction with the other players, certainly not mean or brutal like these American style thematic games. Um, these sort of games with a wooden aesthetic, uh, perhaps a more historical sort of theming, this sort of stuff maybe that's up on this wall behind me. These games, you have an absolute wealth of different publishers who might be interested in looking at your game. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, th those games are eternally popular. They do well in the market. You probably won't make your millions from them, but they'll do all right and they'll get a good following online and so on. If you have uh, an abstract game, so I mean by that a game like chess or checkers, drafts, um, you know, uh, a game where you're, you've got wooden pieces and a grid, no theme attached to it whatsoever. These games can be quite hard to get a publisher to take on. Again, often people self-publish, they construct their own versions made out of wood and, you know, and, and, and laser cut and all that stuff. And they put it together and they sell it themselves. A lot of companies actually have started like this. This is how Blue Orange started, for example, with the game Goblet. Uh, you know, and that generated, you know, enough sales that they then started to publish other games. Um, but you will find a few com companies that will, will, will produce games like this. As ever, it's about doing your research. So companies like Gigamic make a lot of these games. Hook and Friends have the GIP series, which is a real, you know, um, fantastic range of these abstract games. Um, dexterity games. This is where you're stacking pieces, you're flicking pieces, you know, Jenga style sort of games. These, I imagine, would be quite hard to find a publisher for, or I wouldn't know exactly who to approach necessarily. You'd be going to the children's publishers um, and, and they might be interested. You might go to some of those abstract publishers who aren't so concerned about theme uh, and maybe they might take a chance on a, on a dexterity game. But it's going to be a case of, you know, putting the feelers out, asking the question, trying not to waste anyone's time though. What you don't want to do is pile on a load of information to the wrong publisher about a game that they're never going to touch. Another game that you might have to take a punt on, and I think it would be worth taking a punt on, is a party game. I feel like there's been a real renaissance in party games uh, over the last few years, largely driven by sales of code names, which has done amazingly well, and then just one uh, over the last year or so has done very well as well. Um, so I suspect that a lot of publishers who have never made a party game before might be willing to do so uh, now. That said, don't take your party game to a company like GMT who makes war games. They're not going to be interested, are they? Um, but code names came from a, com a company that makes um, European style games. It may be that other European style publishers might be interested in making a party game. American style companies might be interested in making a party game, the same with UK companies. So I think that's again a case of put the feelers out, just ask the question, are you interested in seeing a party game? And when they say no, back away, don't try and sell, okay? Just put the feelers out there and if they say no, move on and ask somebody else. But you may find that you get somewhere with party games right now. Two player only games, uh, I had some two player only games uh, which I started showing to some publishers last year and I found that interesting because again, there's no obvious route for this. There's companies like Hurricane who only do two-player games, but they only produce so few games each year. You know, the, their catalogue is, is lined up way ahead. You, you're not going to get anything into that catalogue easily. And Cosmos, Lookout, they've got two-player ranges. But most companies see two-player only games as limiting um, the potential sales because, you know, if you can play with between two players and six players, or now even more frequently where there's a solo mode in there, that really sort of uh, broadens out who's likely to buy your game. But if you've got a good two player game, then maybe a company is going to take a chance on it. Uh, so it's worth mentioning it to the companies, although there's not an obvious sort of route to market for that style of game. So what do you do? How do you find out which company uh, to approach for your game. Well, the first thing is if you've played only played games like Monopoly and Scrabble and Cluedo and those mass market style games, then you've got a lot of work to do. First thing you need to do is get to your local game store, not your toy shop, not your, your you know, bookshop, whatever, uh, no, local game store. Something that specializes in this sort of stuff, okay, and buy a bunch of them. 
stuff similar to the idea that you've got. Find out what's out there, find out what's popular, find out what you like. Join a gaming group and actually your local game store can probably advise you on how to get involved with a public games group, otherwise you can find them online. But play lots of games and take note of who the publishers are and what's hot, which are the games that everyone's talking about. Get a feel for where the industry is right now, um, just by watching what are people playing and what do people enjoy right now. Um, Next thing is you need to get on the Board Game Geek website. This is a huge database of practically every board game that's ever been invented. Uh, and uh, more importantly than that, when there's a big convention coming up, a big trade fair coming up, like Nuremberg Toy Fair or New York Toy Fair or Gen Con or uh, Essen Spiel convention, Board Game Geek will put up a list of all the publishers that are attending and what games they're releasing. Now that is an invaluable resource because it tells you which publishers are active right now, which publishers are bringing out new games this year. If you just rely on the database, there's going to be loads of publishers that used to exist way back in the archive but have long since disbanded. You need to know what's current right now and what games they're bringing out. Then go back and do your research. Once you've found a publisher that looks like they might be all right and you recognize some of their games, have a look back. What have they produced in the past? Have they ever produced anything like your game? If they haven't, is it a stretch to think that they might? Okay, so War Games, GMT, they're not going to produce your party game, but maybe a Euro style company, it might be just worth asking, okay, politely and then backing away. Even better, if you have a game that is similar to what they've done previously, but with a different sort of um, setting and, and, and different mechanisms in there, then, then you know, that's, that's a win-win situation. Get that in front of that company and they'll probably be willing to meet with you um, at a convention. So attend these conventions. And you don't just have to have meetings lined up that first time you go. Go up to the tables, go up to the stalls and ask the publishers, are you accepting submissions for games? Who would be the person I'd contact? Get business cards from them. What sort of games are you looking for? What sort of games do you think you might produce over the next year or two? Are you going to change direction or are you going to continue doing the stuff that you've done before? These are all reasonable questions and they're questions that publishers will answer um, and, and help you get a feel for the industry. The other thing you can do is get involved in these bigger events which are much more based around the mass market and these have only started to arise as far as I'm aware over the last few years. I'm talking about events like Mojo Nation in the UK um, where you pay to attend but as a result of that you get to pitch to mass market companies. Um, you can pitch to you know Hasbro and Rubik's and um, Amigo and Goliath and you know all manner of different companies will attend these sort of events and you get to pitch to them. You might be wasting your time, of course you might. They've got numerous people pitching to them, they don't produce that many games uh, and uh, they're looking for sales in the you know hundreds of thousands or millions uh, so your game's going to have to really fit what they're looking for right now um, and in the mass market it's unlikely to be this sort of hobbyish type stuff but neither are they looking to produce more um, you know, something similar to Monopoly or Scrabble or Risk or whatever. They, they, they recognise that those things are of their time and they sell through nostalgia. They're looking for stuff that's new. Um, but those events do, uh, do occur and I believe there are other similar events around the world that you could look into. Um, once you've had a game published, then it opened up, opens up new avenues for you. You start to find that publishers who would never have talked to you previously will then approach you or will answer your emails when they never would have done before. Um, and so it's getting that first sort of step in there and getting that first game which people recognise and go, oh yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, that's, that's what you need, okay? And that, that means going with probably a fairly small publisher in the first instance. Now you will, even as a total unknown designer, you can get meetings with um, reasonable sized companies and they may even take your game on and publish it, but your game might end up in the back of their catalogue. They might be producing 20 games this year or more and your game may not be a priority. So it may not get the attention that it deserves, might fall to the back of the catalogue and maybe isn't going to generate any significant sales. So although you've got a big name on the box, sometimes it's better to be with the smaller companies and they are going to have fewer games and particularly if you can find a company that you feel really, really loves what you've done. 
that is going to carry through. They're going to drive, that's going to drive sales because they're going to be passionate, and enthusiastic about everybody they show it to. They're going to make it the best product it can possibly be. And you're going to get modest sales. You're not going to be making those millions, but it does just give you that recognition of saying to people, they may not recognize your name. Okay, when I go and speak to people and I say, oh, I'm Adam Porter, people don't know who I am in the industry. Um, but when I say to them, oh, I, I created the game uh, Doodle Rush and I show them Doodle Rush, they go, yeah, okay, I saw that. I remember that game. Or Picoco, I remember that game. And that's the bit which then opens the door and opens those conversations. Um, so anyway, what was the original question? I'm trying to go back to it now. Uh, it was about what the industry is like right now, what publishers are looking for right now. And the answer is they're looking for everything. It depends on which publisher you're speaking to. I can't tell you where all the money is right now. I don't know. Asmodee is doing very, very well by consolidating the industry, buying up numerous different companies, making lots and lots of different styles of games. And that seems to be working well for them. Uh, other companies that are doing very well are companies like Hasbro, who are, are producing these mass market, um, uh, very sort of plastic, uh, shareable, naughty style games um, without the sort of sophistication in the gameplay of the adult gaming. Um, so it, 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 those are two different ends of the spectrum there. And, and, and you've got to decide uh, what sort of game you want to produce and who's best to show it to. Uh, but it takes a lot of research. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please watch some of my others on my YouTube channel, Adam's Board Game Wales, or follow me on Twitter, at Board Game Wales, on Board Game Geek, I'm Adam78. Thank you very much for watching. All the best.